Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Manager here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you here today for What is Your X? Why the Workplace is the Perfect Place to Discuss the Undiscussable Race and Racism with Margaret Greenberg and Gina Greenlee, authors of The Business of Race. This is the fourth webinar of our 2022 Forum on Workplace Inclusion webinar series. We hope you enjoy this experience and find this information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. Today, Margaret and Gina will be presenting for 45 minutes with questions at the end. The chat has been closed, so please use the Q&A for your chat and comments. Closed captioning is available. Just select the live transcript option on your screen. There's also, <clears throat> At the end of the webinar, you will re sorry, one second. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out the survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRC eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. It is also being recorded and being broadcast live on Facebook. The recording will be posted on our website. So visit forum, workplace, forum on workplaceinclusion.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. The forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, inclusion, education. We provide webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference in the spring. We provide most of these resources like this webinar and podcast for free. We are able to do this thanks to the generous support of our community. We know these resources have a great value to you since so many of you regularly attend them. We're grateful that many of our virtual offerings are often full. In order to sustain our work, we have added a donation button to our website and each webinar and podcast page. There's a suggested donation for each program type we ask that you donate what you feel is the value of the service to help us continue to bring the very best DEI learning and development to you and for us to fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. Every donation is fully tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Without further ado, I would like to go ahead and hand things over to Gina and Margaret. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, thank you so much, Michaela, and thank you all for joining us today. So when Margaret, uh, I'm Gina Greenlee, and my co-author, Margaret Greenberg. Um, when Margaret and I were first uh, researching the business of race, we came across this story. When Canadian-based journalist Andre Domis, who is Black, was in his early 20s, he worked at a cell phone shop in a local mall. Um, one afternoon, while he and his manager worked on a sales report, a young Black man dressed in slacks and a too large blazer came into the store and asked if they were hiring. We were, recalls Domis in an article that Margaret and I found and it made its way into our book. The manager was interviewing on average two people a day in the food court. But as Domis writes, but as my white manager looked up at the young black man in front of him, his eyes lingered for a moment on the man's cornrows before saying, not now, but I'll take your resume. The young man handed over a resume from the stack he carried and thanked the manager. As the applicant turned his back to leave, Domice's manager removed a pen from his shirt pocket and marked the numbers 110 in the corner of the resume. Domice writes, when I later asked what 110 meant, my manager drew a diagonal line between the two ones changing the three digit code to the word no. Nothing more needed to be said between us, writes Andre Domis. The company they worked for, this is Margaret and I speaking now, the company they worked for took pride in its commitment 
to diversity, painstakingly outlined in the employment contract both Domice and his manager had signed. But despite all of that, Domice writes, I just watched my white manager profile a black youth out of a job. It's tempting to point to a single person, the manager in this story, as the villain. If it weren't for him, that young man might have had a chance. Or point to Domis and say, what do you mean nothing more needed to be said between us? Why didn't you speak up? It's too easy to scape an individual. In doing so, we let the institution and its practices off the hook and nothing changes. This story is not about the manager. Rather, it highlights the need to examine a system, the system of, of work, one that hired and retains a manager in a position of power and authority to racially profile prospective employees unchecked. So we begin with that story because that's what our presentation is about today. Um, the system known as work. So, what is today's agenda? We're gonna start off with what is the business of race, the book. Then we're gonna move on to the business case for why Margaret and I believe that the workplace is the best place to do this work, to advance racial equity. And then we're gonna talk about, well, how does that translate to strategy? Margaret and I are organizational development professionals. We are not DEI professionals, though we did interview more than two dozen um, business professionals for our book, and they include DEI practitioners who've been doing, some of whom have been doing this work for decades, because we certainly stand on their shoulders and we needed to educate ourselves. And then, of course, we will open it up to Q&A. So as we move in to discuss the business of work and why we believe race is one of the best places to do this work, I will turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, Margaret B Greenberg, who will share the book. Thank you, Gina, and welcome everyone. Uh, the Business of Race is actually organized into 14 chapters. And the first half of the book focuses on what we call the inner work, meaning raising our awareness, having a shared language and context, and building new ways of thinking and being in, these, in this multicultural world that um, we live in. The first half also focuses on developing uh, five core, uh, core muscles. Uh, the second half of the book, which is um, where we're going to draw upon for this afternoon's um, webinar, focuses in on what we call the outer work, the policies and practices that organizations must reimagine to create and sustain an anti-racist workplace. Uh, we often think of policies and practices as simply you know, hiring and promoting more racially diverse talent, um, but, but that's not, not so. There are so many other policies and practices that must be reimagined. Everything from procurement to marketing, advertising, philanthropy, um, et cetera. Now there are five um, key themes in the business of race that I just wanna highlight. Uh, first is it is um, what we call a new lens to look at DEI in the workplace. Um, we do not take a social justice lens. We take a business lens. And yes, we believe that there is a moral imperative, but that's not the focus of the business of race. We look at racial diversity like you would any other strategic business priority. So first and foremost, it's a business. And then the other lens is an asset, what we call an asset lens. We apply the science of positive psychology to race work. For example, um, we look um, at what businesses um, can gain by creating a more racially diverse workplace. Uh, we look at calling people in rather than calling people out. And we focus on turning microaggressions into micro opportunities. So again, a new lens. Second theme is one of self-discovery. We, what we mean by that is the inner work, again, that we all need to do, no matter our race. 
The third theme is that this is not a program. This is a journey, which means your journey will be different from everyone else's journey. No two journeys will look alike. There is no formula. There is no prescription. And then the fourth theme is what we call um, the power of stories. We need new narratives. We need new stories from new and more diverse perspectives. As the science fiction author Ursula Le Guin um, said, there have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. And then the last theme is one of courage. Courage to name what you see, to look at yourself, to change the status quo. Know this, you are going to make mistakes. You will need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable and you will need to be resilient. Our hope in writing The Business of Race would, was that it would give readers the courage to talk about race and racism and moreover, to do something constructive about it, no matter your level in your organization, no matter your racial identity. So let me turn it over to Gina, um, who's going to uh, walk us through the first part of what's the business case for racial diversity, not diversity in general, but specific to racial diversity. Gina? Thank you, Margaret. So Margaret and I believe there are six reasons why the workplace is, is the perfect place to advance uh, racial equity. Um, as Margaret shared, uh, we absolutely believe uh, in the moral imperative. We, we support other institutions, um, healthcare, um, education, um, law enforcement. Um, we support them in, in their advances toward um, uh, more racial equity in their institutions, but we, we couldn't boil the ocean. So we focused on what we know and it is the workplace. So the first reason why we believe the workplace is one of the perfect places to do this work is because first and foremost, it's where we interact with people from differing backgrounds uh, on a regular basis. For many people, the workplace is the first time at first and only may only be, be the only time they meet someone who is from a different racial or ethnic background different from theirs in fact that is how margaret and i met one, one another more than two decades ago i hired margaret um, when we were both living in um, the state of connecticut and i was living in the multicultural um, capital city of Hartford, and Margaret at that time was raising her then young family about 25 miles east of the capital city in an exclusively uh, rural white suburb. And so uh, I did my networking, this is in the days before LinkedIn, I picked up the phone and I said, I need a consultant um, to um, help me work with a senior group and strategy. Who do you know? They told me about Margaret. She came in, I interviewed her, she was great, but we never would have met, there'd be no reason for, us, for our paths to cross otherwise. So this in the United States, again, our book, because we are both from the United States, again, our hope is that people will look at our book and then look at the racial inequities in their own countries and their own cultures and, and tell those stories and, and share those narratives. Um, but the United States is still very much um, segregated when it comes to housing. So we've actually had people email us after webinars and say, you know, I was in my 20s before I actually met a, a Black person or an Asian person. So um, navigating a multicultural workplace in the 21st century is really an imperative. The second reason why we believe the workplace is one of the best places to do this work is because of the um, existence of a ready-made coalition. Every day, scores, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands in the case of, of large um, matrix uh, corporations, come, people come together to advance 
um, a common goal. That's going to be um, developing uh, and marketing products and services. So you already have people working together, grappling um, with one another constructively to advance a common goal. Why not use that existing dynamic to advance racial equity. The third reason why we believe the workplace is one of the best places to do this work is, is because in the workplace, acquiring new skills is expected. If you're going to remain relevant as an employee, um, if you're going to main, remain relevant as an employer um, and in your, in your industry over time, um, learning new skills right? Moving tech, you know, new technologies are, are, are happening all the time. It's going to be important that the skill of navigate, navigating a multicultural workplace is a core skill in the 21st century. It's not a nice to have. It's an imperative if you want to remain relevant. And so since we're all accustomed to having to learn new skills, you know, every year, in fact, you know, uh, Ben mentioned that this webinar and other webinar, webinars um, allow you to uh, 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 get a sure a sure credit and so you're always learning and you're always growing so we expect to do this in our work lives anyway let's let's add that to the play another reason why we believe the workplace is one of the best places to do this work is that unfortunately um, in the again we're speaking about the United States um, trying to talk about race and racism online at the coffee shop while standing online getting your sandwich at a sandwich shop it may deteriorate it may escalate in the workplace we have professional norms that boundary our behavior guide our behavior. So again, we're already used to uh, productively grappling with each other, one another, with our ideas to advance the common goal of the market, of the products and services that we put out in the marketplace. And we, we need to, certainly we disagree with one another, but we need to do that within a, a range of professionally accepted behavior. So, you know, you, in other words, you can't just go off, you know, in the workplace. We've been challenged on this point and people have said, well, what about microaggressions? Well, as Margaret said in the beginning, we, we, uh, we're not saying microaggressions don't exist. What we're saying is um, how can you, how can we take advantage of the opportunities that come up in microaggressions um, to, to advance more constructive dialogue and um, policy and practices in our workplace. The fifth reason why we believe the workplace is one of the best places to advance racial equity is because historically the workplace has been a catalyst for transformational change throughout society from the industrial revolution to the digital revolution. We have seen, you know, over and over again, how the workplace affects society. We have seen that most recently with the pandemic. Um, businesses, employers were well ahead of, of governments in protecting their employees by saying, you know, everybody shelter in place, stay at home, work from home. And, and today, um, that has literally transformed how, how people work. So um, this um, application, Zoom, not only used for work now, people were, you know, were having bridal showers and weddings and, and going to funerals using Zoom. So this is a work tool. However, it has absolutely affected how we live the, the other parts of our lives. So um, society influences the workplace and the workplace influences society. We Businesses do not operate in a vacuum. So, um, we need to learn how to name without shaming or blaming when it comes to race and racism in the institution known as work because it's happening in society and employees are bringing their whole selves to work. They're bringing their lived experiences. You know, in my case, part of my lived experiences is what happens because of the fact that I'm a woman, I'm a cisgender woman, the color of my skin. I don't leave that at home when I come to work. So these are the six reasons why we believe that this is one of the best places to advance a more racially equitable society. So 
I'm going to let Margaret continue the, the rest of the business case by talking about the metrics side, because without metrics, you have no accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, let me begin with this quote uh, from Vijay S. Warren. He says, the case for establishing a truly diverse workforce grows more compelling each year. The moral argument is weight enough, but the financial impact, as proven by multiple studies, makes this a no-brainer. Now, let me just uh, stay on this slide for a moment, and I'd like to highlight um, something. Notice how we uh, ethnically identify Vijay as Malaysian Indian, and we do that throughout the book, The Business of Race, um, for the people that we've interviewed, the people that we quote, the researchers that we quote. And the reason why we do is we want for people to really understand the lived experiences of the people that we are quoting. So you'll notice that in our slides, you'll also notice that uh, in our book. So uh, Mr. Eswaran says, you know, it's a no brainer given the, the studies, right? So what are those studies? Well, in the time that we have today, we're not gonna go into all of them. But what, what I will say is this, um, there's a plethora of research, decades even, on the impact of diversity in general, meaning, you know, gender um, experiences, communication styles, et cetera on organizations. So there's lots of research that has shown that the more diverse an organization is, uh, the more they outperform less diverse organizations on the basis of these four measures, profit, innovation, productivity, and attracting and retaining talent. But as we we're researching uh, for our book, uh, we really wanted to stay in the lane of racial diversity. So we kept digging and we did in fact, find research by some of the, you know, biggest consulting companies like McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Deloitte, and others that showed racial diversity does in fact increase these four metrics um, as well. Um, so we believe we have a big, a great opportunity before us here. So what about the E? So E is the measurement. And Equity is a relatively, um, we call a newcomer on the scene. For years, we talked about diversity, then inclusion came onto the scene, and now equity. So what is E? We posit that E measures how and to what extent diversity and inclusion are embedded into an organization's business strategy and every business policy and practice. And E, equity, perpetually monitors and as necessary, recalibrates the diversity and inclusion to stay ahead of potential relapses and continue, continually advance toward an anti-racist workplace. In business, we set strategy, we set goals, and then we um, define how we will measure success and identify who is accountable. Race work is no different. This is a quote that we love by one of our heroes, Melody Hobson, uh, a black American. She's the chair of Starbucks board. She's also the co-CEO and president of Aerial Investments. And she says this, math has no opinion. But in this area, meaning a diversity, we want credit for trying. You don't get credit for trying to meet earnings expectations. You don't get credit for trying to deliver product on time to your client. You either do or you do not. And that's what Gina and I mean by treat racial equity like you would any other strategic business uh, imperative. Uh, and it can indeed be measured. So to uh, wrap up um, this, this piece um, that you have to embed racial equity into every business practice, um, to wrap up, think of it this way, equity proves true when measures, meaning accountability, are in place to determine how and to what extent diversity and inclusion are embedded into an organization's business strategy in every business policy and practice. 
Okay, go if you can go back one more, Gina. Um, I just want to say in accountability are measures that perpetually monitor. Okay. And when more and more innovative companies are tying executive compensation uh, uh, to their racial equity goals and really tying those two together so that the, the, the leaders of the company are in fact accountable. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Gina then. If that's the business case, how does strategy fit in and how does it get developed? Thank you, Margaret. So um, individuals do not come to what Margaret and I call race work from the same, same starting place. Margaret talked about that when she shared the, the key, the five core themes, overriding themes. There's multiple themes, but those are the overriding themes in the, in the business of race. Okay. Everyone starts from a different place and everyone journeys at a different rate. And we actually share quite a bit of scholarship uh, about the nature of how humans um, think, how we learn, how we grow, and how we evolve, okay? So, um, so organizations it, need to get a pulse on where they are. So they benchmark. Benchmark, uh, like any other strategic uh, business imperative, okay, organizations must measure, must benchmark where they are today and then repeat the process um, to measure progress toward goals. So um, when you embark on any strategic change, it's a good idea to examine your current state. You may not know at the outset what to do, but knowing your current state will help you pinpoint where to start. So let's look at one organizational benchmarking tool, and this is called the OSA. So what is the OSA? Um, this is developed by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. They've been around for about a hundred years. Uh, we have this information is all in our book. It's on our website as one of the um, additional resources. Um, the Annie E. Casey uh, Foundation focuses on family and children. Um, and it was actually begun by one of the, the eldest of the four children of, of Annie E. Casey. She was a single mother, so that was really the focus on children and families. And her eldest son went on to um, start UPS. So this is the family that created that foundation, and they have a number of um, uh, social justice tools on their website, and this is one. It is a discussion starter for organizational readiness for change. It is on a Likert scale. It asks 29 statements. And basically, um, while it's targeted toward uh, individuals who have positional power, hierarchical power within an organization, certainly if you are a sole contributor, um, you can use your voice, and we talk a lot about that in the book, to influence um, those who do have positional hierarchy in your organization. And very often a lot of the, we have multiple case studies uh, in our book where there's a lot of cross-functional strategy teams that come together, bringing different, uh, bringing employees from different levels of the organization, different functional um, areas of the organization to give voice to where the, they believe the organization needs to go. So there's 29 statements and it, 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 there are no right or wrong answers. You just need to answer them true, mostly true, sometimes true, not true. And that is, will gauge the current state and identify the next steps about your organization. And the results based on the responses to these 29 statements on a Likert scale, um, your organization will come out with um, four, one of four. Um, Margaret, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, uh, someone asked a question, uh, they missed, what does the OSA stand for? It stands for the Organizational Self-Assessment. And I put in the chat box where you can access it at um, uh, AECF.org. Thank you. Thank you. So the organizational self-assessment. So there's basically, there are four 
different approaches. So let's look at some of the characteristics of the four organizational approaches based on the responses to the OSA. Um, there's colorblind, diversity only, race tentative, and equity focus. So colorblind, an organization that takes a colorblind approach uh, shrinks opportunities for discovery among employees, you know, you know, we don't we don't see color, and it, it shrinks those opportunities for employees and for the organization because, and it can also fuel animosity by de denying the history and culture of marginalized groups. So if you so here's the business case: uh, when organizations take a color blind approach uh, to racial diversity. Those organizations fail to see the opportunities to grow market share, for example, in undeserved populations. So what does colorblind look like from an organizational perspective? Such an organization will avoid or shut down conversations about race and they because they believe it will only create unimaginable um, discord. So that's an example of based on how individuals in an organization answer, um, and these are usually individuals who would be part of a management team, and again, cross-functional team, human resources people, um, color, that's the colorblind strategy. The diversity only strategy is where an organization proposals universal strategies that are presumed to work for all employees. And that's talking about racial diversity or gender, LGBTQ, veterans, age. So it's, it's really a broad brush approach. A characteristic of a race tentative organization is one in which employees or the management have gone through anti-racism or uh, unconscious bias training, uh, but the organization is still not clear. So everybody's trained in this, but the organization doesn't really know what to do next. What's the next step? Lastly, an organization that has taken an equity focused approach has put those measures in place for account or um, operational and management accountability. Again, like it would for any other strategic imperative. So how to use the OSA? Again, there's no, as Margaret shared, there's no formula for what race work looks like in a, a given organization, be it for-profit, not-for-profit, you know, university, healthcare, corporate. Um, but here, but often we're asked about, well, what would come next? And so depending upon where the organization is, here's some examples. First of all, you can give it as pre-work. Um, and then what you want to do is use a skilled facilitator um, to help the organization um, discuss how each person scored the organization, okay? Now, most likely, people are going to see things differently. And that's what I talked about earlier, that the fact that we already have, we're already grappling with each other to solve a wide range of, of business problems. Um, so we're, we're, we're accustomed to doing that. So with a skilled facilitator, um, you, you will see that people do things differently and let's get rated the organization differently and get curious about why that is. That's one of the opportunities. Another great opportunity for progress is, is to look at the assessment statements that were not checked, meaning this doesn't happen in our organization and leverage, and leverage those that were checked focus on the strengths. Um, another way to use the organizational self-assessment, it is a launching off point, a feed for a SOAR analysis that Mark is going to talk about um, shortly. You may be familiar with SWOT analysis, SWOT strengths, you know, you know uh, weaknesses and threats. Th that is deficit language, and we take an asset view of this work. So we think of opportunities as and aspirations, and Margaret will talk about that. And then, again, whatever benchmarking tool you use, and we know that you, you you do some type of benchmarking already. We're just saying apply that to race work, assign accountabilities and agree to follow up on progress at least quarterly. Retake the assessment annually to continue your journey. 
So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to talk about the SOAR analysis. Thank you, Gina. And I just wanna make note, um, we have two people, Justin Hall and Bridget uh, 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 Clyda, who both have their hands raised. Uh, Justin and Bridget, we're gonna go into Q&A uh, literally like in five more minutes. Um, so just hang in there and we'll, we'll get to your questions. Um, so the SOAR uh, analysis, it is a powerful business planning tool to collaboratively engage people at any level in your organization to develop your company's racial diversity strategy. Uh, unlike that traditional SWOT analysis that Gina mentioned, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, um, that really focuses 50% of your time on deficits, SOAR uses an asset approach, which is consistent with the approach that runs throughout the, our entire book. This doesn't mean that SOAR ignores weaknesses or threats, but instead it prompts leaders to reframe them into opportunities, aspirations, and results, which creates a much more empowering, energizing, and actionable discussion. Um, it doesn't ignore difficult conversations either, but what it does do is it gives the space to reimagine what is power you know, what is possible. Now, SOAR comes from research conducted by business professor uh, Jackie Stavros at Lawrence Technological University in Michigan. Um, she did this for her doctorate um, in management studies uh, more than two decades ago. And since then, it has been used by micro businesses to global businesses, to the US Army uh, and nonprofit organizations. You can use SOAR for any strategy you want to develop, including race work. The really cool thing about SOAR is that it helps put our brains in a more positive emotional state. And this allows us co to connect with others and to be more creative. Two really important conditions to cultivate any kind of work, but especially uh, race work. Because all emotions, be them you know, positive or negative, they affect our ability to think creatively. Have you ever tried to brainstorm with someone that's in a lousy mood? It can't be done. When we are in a positive emotional state, we are much more open to novel ideas and to possibilities. And this is what um, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill calls broaden and build theory. So what happens when we kick off meetings by asking people, you know, what kept you up last night? What's wrong? Or identify weaknesses, threats. We inadvertently put people into what we call protective mode. But instead, when we ask people about their strengths, our brains launch into what um, Dr. Stavros calls this connect mode. For example, if a threat to creating a racially diverse and inclusive workplace is that you're afraid of losing talented employees to your competitors, well, SOAR reframes that threat and instead talks about it in the context of an opportunity. So for example, what marketplace opportunities might arise from creating an environment where racially diverse employees can contribute fully? What are the recruitment, retention, productivity opportunities? Notice the discussion is gonna go in a very different direction. Reframing things into the positive doesn't mean that you are avoiding difficult conversations or are speaking in euphemisms. Rather, it articulates what you want to happen, which broaden and builds a discussion, which is a much more um, actionable um, uh, direction. So now in the business of race, uh, we actually give some uh, examples of questions that you can ask for each of these four quadrants. Let me read a couple to you. Uh, under strengths, questions such as, what are we already doing well? when it comes to our race work. One of the tenets of behavioral change is we are more 
open to going into the unknown when we know that we're keeping something of our present, something that's working well that we're going to take with us into the future. Another question you might ask under strengths, um, what are we most proud of when it comes to the race work we've done thus far? Uh, for opportunities, uh, we might ask, what opportunities do we see? And also from an external perspective, what have other companies done that we admire? Uh, under aspirations, you might ask questions such as, what do we want to be known for in the marketplace? And what impact might we have in the world? And then lastly, under results, a couple of questions you might ask, um, what will we know, or excuse me, how will we know if we are successful? How will we measure progress? As we talked about earlier, what are the metrics? How will we measure progress? So those are some examples of, of um, SOAR questions. Keep in mind, you can use SOAR no matter where you are in your race journey. Um, it's questions that can energize, engage people, uh, and really embed it into um, your culture and your strategy. So with that, um, let's go into Q&A. And while we wait for our first questions to come in, um, this is how you can continue to engage with us, our website, businessofrace.com. Uh, while we hope we've piqued your interest to want to read our whole book, uh, you can download a free chapter uh, on our website. You can contact us uh, by email, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and we have um, some free events coming up on uh, Eventbrite. And you can see the URL um, pasted there. Um, know this too, uh, we mentioned several tools today, the SOAR, uh, the OSA, the Organizational Assessment. There are more than 40 tools in the business of race and they're all listed in the resource section and 95% of them are free. Um, so with that, um, Michaela, um, do we have any questions coming in? Right now, it doesn't look like we have any questions in our Q&A, so I'd like to remind everyone if they are interested, they can use that Q&A section to input their questions. And I think um, Justin and Bridget, they had their hand raised previously, so I don't know if they want to type in their question. Oh, here's a question. Um, how is success of use of SOAR framework measured or determined? So success of the use of the SOAR framework. Um, think of, um, Gina mentioned earlier, the OSA, the organizational assessment is a input or a, a feed into the SOAR analysis. Um, in terms of how successful the tool is itself, um, that's really based upon what are the actions that come out of it. Think of it as a discussion to identify the strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. And then after you have that discussion, um, turning those, especially the opportunities, into actionable steps with clear accountability. Who's going to own that? Um, who's, you know, I'll give an example. An opportunity might be uh, we need to reimagine our onboarding process. Um, okay, um, who's going to take that? Whose input do we need? When do we want to come back? Uh, and who's going to approve um, that work that's been done? So I'd say the success of it is, is what kind of actions actually come out of it, um, not just talk. Uh, Gina, you want to take the next one? Uh, Tony Moss has a question. Could you speak to responding to an organization hesitant to exploring this topic? Yes, Margaret. Thank you, Tony, for your question. Uh, yeah, as Margaret and I, as, as we share, Margaret and I are organizational development um, practitioners. Um, and so when an organization is hesitant to do anything, the first thing we're going to do is ask questions. Um, so hesitant to exploring this topic, part of that is going to be what is the, you know, what have you done? Again, we're going to do our own 
assessment and benchmarking. So what have you done or not done? What has worked, has not worked? Where, what is the, what is the, the cause of the hesitancy? Before I could, again, this is not just add water. There's no formulas. So it's not um, a broad brush um, response. It, what we would say would be particular to what was going on in the organization and what the nature of the hesitancy is and where it is. You know, again, you, you have organizations that are really large and there could be some teams, again, in organizational development, we look at self, the individual team, and then the organization. So there are some teams who are ready to go, they're at, they're at one place, you know, other teams are in a different place. They're, they're, not, they're not hesitant. So it's really in the, that we take that OD approach. Margaret, did you wanna share? something additional to that? No, no, uh, that's fine. I'll take the next question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gina. Um, uh, there was also one other question anonymous said, is that the two of you on this slide? Um, yes, uh, it is the two of us. Um, actually, oh. pre-COVID, um, we haven't actually been in each other's company. We wrote this entire book virtually. Gina is in Florida. Uh, I'm in Maine. And um, but this was pre-COVID um, when we were actually still able to give hugs. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, um, and thank you for that question, um, Margaret, I think this it might be a quick opportunity to share. First of all, I have to say, Margaret and I are in our early 60s, and there we were, uh, that was about 15 years ago, and we still look fabulous, if I say so <laughs> my own self. Um, <laughs> um, but Margaret, why don't you, can you briefly share how, how we came to write this book? Because I think that's an important story when we're talking about narratives and we're talking about origin. Sure, sure. Um, so you might recall uh, May 26th, 2020 was the day after George Floyd's murder. And I called my friend Gina uh, just to check in on her. And all I said was, uh, Gina, um, you know, how are you doing? And what's, what's happening in the world? And uh, I really appreciate that. I was, it was, it was a hard, it was a hard day for me. And, uh, and many days and many weeks and time thereafter, and I'm still on my own, my own journey. Uh, but I, I appreciate Margaret reaching out to me from 1500 miles away recognizing, you know, Margaret and I have been friends for more than two decades, 22, 23 years. And I can count on one hand the number of times we've spoken about our differing racial identities and the different lived experiences that flow from that identity. And not, and it, it just, you know, we were girlfriends. We were hanging out and having fun. And then with George Floyd's murder, when she reached out to me, I, I began to speak and share about some of the challenges I had as a black woman in this country. And Margaret was really moved by some of my stories and asked me and suggested that I write about them. And I said, no, nope. because when I have written about them in the past, when I was the columnist for the Hartford Current, I was accused of being the stereotypical black woman, angry black woman. So I said, nah, I'm not gonna write about that, Margaret. Thanks though. Thanks for calling me. Um, and I said, well, what if, we wrote something together. And of course, not a book. We weren't even thinking book at that point. Um, we wrote just one article um, called um, The Workplace is the Perfect Place to Discuss the Undiscussables, meaning race and racism. And because we're business women, we posted it on LinkedIn. And there was such an outpouring of response from readers saying, finally, we're able to talk about this taboo subject um, thank you. And that, that response encouraged us to write another article and another article and another article. And I, I think it was, ended up being maybe a six part series. And, and after that, it was like, gee, maybe we should write a book. Um, and that's how it, it came to be. Yes. And, and, I, and I think it's really important to point out our two voices, because I said to Margaret, yeah, I'm. I'm just. I would be dismissed as the angry, stereotypical, angry black woman. And if you were to write about my stories, you know, about my experience or what you've heard, you will be dismissed as the privileged white woman. So let's do something together. Let's. We wanted to model something that we were not seeing, which is direct 
candid, non-euphemistic conversation, not about diversity in general, but racial diversity. You can name without shaming or blaming. And if you do not name, then nothing changes. So with that, Mario, um, what are some likely metrics for equity? Um, I, Michaela, I don't know if you can help us out on this, but if you go to the business of race, www, business of race, it doesn't say business, the business of race.com. There's a blog post there about um, the EE01. Um, if some of you are human resources professionals, you probably know about the EE01 report. Um, and um, that's, Mario, that's one concrete example example. I wrote a detailed blog post and there's lots of resources in that blog post. Um, and the EE01 is a report that every, um, it's a federally required report for organizations who employ a um, hundred or more people. They need to file it annually. This has been the law since the, I believe the late 1960s, again, driven by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And um, uh, historically, it gets sent to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, but it's since the murder of George Floyd, of course, there have been scores and hundreds of other people of color who have been murdered since then. But that was the lightning rod that went around the world. Investors are now, particularly for publicly traded companies, investors are now asking for that to be made public. Why, Mario? Because if you take what we call in our book a lumping approach to your general diversity metric is, oh, well, 65% of our company, you know, is comprised of people of color. But then if you were to break that down, which is what the EE01 does, it breaks it down by race, by ethnicity, by levels within the organization, even defining levels um, close to the C-suite, you might find that of the 65% of people uh, of color, again, we're talking about racial diversity in our book because that's our lane, not because we don't care about other types of diversity. If you break that down, the EEO1 can show you, well, of that 65%, most of the people of color are concentrated at entry level, a sprinkle of middle management, and you have nobody in the C-suite. You have no representation. So that's one. So what happens is that's a benchmark, right? We talked about the OSA, but now that's a benchmark. So investors are saying, well, hey, we want to invest in companies who are environmentally and socially responsible. So again, I'm sure you've heard the term ESG, environmental social governance. This is, um, this is one way to measure that. Margaret, did you want to add or did you want to go to the next yeah, question? Um, yeah, I'd like to add a couple other things there. Um, I can't recall the, the name of the assessment right now, but there's another uh, assessment in the book uh, that we cite uh, around marketing and looking at your marketing um, uh, to see what percentage of people in your marketing materials are people of color. Uh, what percentage of people of color are in um, uh, your leadership development programs, your uh, external panels maybe with customers. Um, so if that unbundling approach, Gina says, you know, we tend to lump things together. We, we really advocate unbundling and those equity measures are going to be unique to your company and get your, um, you know, your financial, your math people that are really good at identifying metrics, get them involved in this process and they can help you uh, define what they look like. I would just, I do want to um, just uh, address this question. Um, Anonymous said, um, are you aware of the IDI, the Intercultural Development Inventory tool? And if so, would you recommend using this tool with the OSA? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we actually cite uh, the IDI in um, the business of race. Again, another tool um, and again, we didn't have time today to go to go into it. Uh, but yes, that is another um, highly credible um, tool. Uh, to I, and I will say that we about the IDI um, and we haven't written the blog post yet because it's still in my brain. But <laughs> we have connected thanks to Margaret. See, she's the extrovert on the team and I'm the introvert. See, so she reaches out to the people and then I write the stuff. <laughs> But we do both, actually. We've reached out to uh, a number of the people that we cited in the book to connect with them. Um, and 
we, we've spoken with uh, at length with Dr. Bennett and um, we're gonna be doing, he has done, we need to do some update, you know, um, on the IDI, but that's a good place to start. And he has taken that another step further and we will be citing his most recent research. But yes, that's where we started in August of 2021. Great. Um, Gina, there's another question here from Gregory DeShields, who asks, can you discuss the increased focus on performance and outcome? How do you manage expectations for those who feel DEI is fixable rather than an ongoing part of an organizational culture? So I'll start with the, the first part of that question. Can you discuss the increased focus on performance and outcome? Um, Yes, um, until we can talk about results, outcomes, um, until we can use the language of business, nothing is going to change. We can, you know, check off a box that we um, conducted, you know, unconscious bias training and check the box and then, you know, be done with it until next year comes around again. Uh, or maybe there's a lawsuit, um, a discrimination lawsuit at your company. Uh, but nothing really changes. So that's why we wholehearted be believe as, as the business leaders that we interviewed that you have to have specific outcomes, measures um, that are continually monitored and just like you would anything else. And I would say, if you go back to um, uh, gender diversity, think about where we were with gender diversity uh, 20 years ago. Um, that was measured, that was accountability, that was part of, of out, outcomes. And we've seen progress in gender diversity. Um, we now need to put that same uh, pressure uh, on uh, racial diversity as well. Uh, Gina, what about the second part of the question? Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that really quickly because it's 12.58, wanna be respectful of people's time. And I did wanna get to the question, anonymous attendee, which is probably gonna be the last question. How do you manage racial trauma in an organizational context? I think that's, that's a really important question. I, what I'll say in uh, the second part, uh, in response to the second part of Gregory's question is, here's just a really concrete example in about 30 seconds is, yeah, people have an expectation. So here, you know, oh, I'm going to hire a head of DEI. You, you know, everybody in their mama or, uh, hired a, a DEI head right after <laughs> or promised to after the murder of George Floyd. Okay. So again, if you use the language of business, of organizational um, development and change, you know that just by hiring, you know, ahead of anything, right? If that that person is going to have to be matrix throughout the organization. So first of all, you want that person has to be at the table. Anything that is strategically, so typically that, so what we would suggest is not just hiring that person, but making sure that person needs to be reporting to the CEO, needs to be uh, on the board, you know, participating in the board. Every time there is a strategic discussion in an organization, whether it's about procurement, um, whether it's about hiring, whether it's, you know, about vendors, whether it's about philanthropy, whether it's about marketing, that person and the team of individuals, because again, they're not working by themselves. They're going to bring bringing cross-functional um, brains and eyes and hearts to this needs to have a voice in every one of those functions. That's, that's so when people have expectations, I can check the box. You know what you say? It is doomed to failure. That's what you say. If you expect just you're just going to hire one person and then you're done, you will fail. That's what you say. That's how you manage the expectation. And if they want to do that, then that's their choice. Now, uh, I do want to get to this question. How do you manage racial trauma in an organizational context? Uh, this will be our last question in the interest of time. Many people who have experienced racism carry trauma with them wherever they go, including the workplace. So that is a fantastic question. And um, I think, uh, I think, um, and Margaret, I think might want to share something. Well, first of all, there are organizations, there's a number of different ways. 
and again, part of that will come from what the organization is doing already, what has worked, what has what hasn't worked, and, and even outside of race work. And then, well, this is this kind of um, dynamic work really well in our company. How can we apply that to helping employees who are experiencing racial trauma? Um, there are employee resource groups. There's a, a, Margaret, did you want to say something about employee resource groups? Because we we interviewed some people who have a lot of success with that. Yeah, many companies um, have ERGs, employee resource groups, um, whereby um, people that have something in common, whether it is uh, uh, AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islanders, or, or um, Black or Latino, um, can come together as a support group for each other, as well as advisors to the senior leadership of the company. So that could potentially be a place to address um, racial trauma as, as this person asked. Great, well, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm, I guess I'll turn it over to Benjamin or, but um, we really appreciate um, the time here with Augsburg. Thank you all, thank you all for your great questions. Thank you both so much, Gina and Margaret, for the wonderful podcast. A special thank you to every, everybody who joined us today and for your great questions and engagement. As promised, um, the HRCI activity ID is 598027, and the SHRM activity ID is 22-DRZR7. Uh, -R so those Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, but yes, I just wanna say thank you for your questions. And we, we may keep an eye out. We may be doing a follow-up podcast to answer some of the questions that we weren't able to get to. So keep an eye out for that. Um, join us in July for Beyond the Game, Blame Game, Religion and the LGBTQ Inclusion at Work with Nina Bo of Tannenbaum Center for in Interreligious Understanding and John marie Navetti of PFLIGHT on Thursday, July 21st at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. New episodes of the Forum on Workplace Inclusion podcast are available. Visit forumworkplaceinclusion.org forward slash podcast to listen. And the podcasts are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and Stitcher. And the recording of this webinar, along with PDF of the slides, will be available on our website for the next week. Thank you again for joining us, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.